17 staff that work here at Wachabal, and that number of hours is equivalent to over four additional full-time staff. So that is nothing to um, take lightly. That is really a significant addition to the work that we can do. And it's also significant financially because that is equivalent to over $270,000 of paid time. And that is also not a small portion of the budget that we have. So you really make a huge difference. You also had 504 audiobooks in process, 127 new audiobooks uploaded to BARD, 91 Braille books in process, 21 Braille books completed, and our locally produced audiobooks circulated nearly 4,000 times and were downloaded 2,000 times. And I just want to remind everybody that that's nationally. And in fact, those local audiobooks and Braille books can be borrowed by people internationally from countries that are part of the Marrakesh Treaty, meaning they can borrow those books internationally and share them across borders, helping to end the global book famine for people with print disabilities. So your reach and your work travels far and wide. And our locally produced Braille circulated 50 times and was downloaded over 20, 25 times. And I want to make a little note with that, saying that we have not been able to put our Braille up on the download site for quite some time because they're changing the process. We're almost ready to be able to put our braille up again. We have a bunch of books ready to go. And I know that number is going to skyrocket. So amazing work. And I'd like to just emphasize again the importance of the work you do by sharing a note from one of our patrons, who is a lovely person who sends us really charming notes. And what he said is your books make each day better with the ability to enjoy past, present, and future life experiences not otherwise possible. Your stories transport this old guy to the wonder of life outside my own. My heart is full of thanks. And I would say my heart is also full of thanks. And I know that the staff and patrons of our Watauga community thank you as well. So thank you. And I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Jones, our Washington State Librarian. Thank you. Do the poll that's I'm getting over it, but just in case I'm talking to it. Well, hope it doesn't happen, but I'm so glad to be here. I um, want to um, thank you on behalf of myself, the state librarian, and the office of the Secretary of State and the Secretary Steve Hobbs. I'm not sure if he's, he's just about to embark on a trade mission to Japan, so that's some exciting things that Steve's working on. But the focus, of course, today is about you and our appreciation for you. And I just wanted to um, I wanted to uh, give you a quote about volunteerism, which I think really fits with what uh, Danielle was saying. And it's, it is that volunteers do not necessarily have the time, they just have the heart. Uh, that's by Elizabeth Andrews, who's an author. And I guess that it's just so important, I think, this theme of, of the work that you give to us, we quantify in the, the time, um, the ability to, for us to serve better, ability to really engage a community, all those things are tremendously important. But what's, what's most important, I think, is that you give us that time and that you do that because you care about this program and you care about making sure that everyone has access to reading materials and how critically important that is. So I just, uh, my most sincere thanks to you. And then I also feel like I was, as I was thinking about any remarks today as I was driving up from Olympia, I was thinking that, you know, it's just, um, an amazing part to celebrate this, your, your contributions and what you're doing to make such a big difference in a world that's really um, difficult right now. I, I think in my lifetime, which is now I can say significant, it, we're facing some of the most difficult times that maybe we faced, you know, um, in, in many, many decades, if not in, you know, for a very long time. But the, the fact that people give and that they support one another in their communities. And as Daniel said, not only do you support folks in, in this community, in the state of Washington, but nationally and internationally with your work, that's really profound. And I just want to offer my most sincere 
thanks, appreciation, and gratitude for all that you do. And then always, uh, as you know, this is an amazing staff doing wonderful works, always trying to make this better, stronger, just a more vital program under wonderful leadership of Danielle. So I'm always proud to be any part of this. And I'm particularly proud that our beautiful building is now representing its beautiful self again. So thank you. <laughs> Didn't even move the microphone up, even though she's <laughs> like a foot taller than me. <laughs> so now I have a, a very special um, privilege to have this great section of our program here, um, the Washington State Volunteer Service Award. I'd like to invite up Major General Brett Dougherty to present the Washington State Volunteer Service Award for the North Puget Sound region from Serve Washington to our amazing longtime volunteer narrator, Rick Seif. But first, I'd like to share a bit of background about the Major General. Major General Brett Dougherty is the Adjutant General for the state of Washington. He is the Commanding General of the 6,000 soldiers and 2,000 airmen of the Washington National Guard. General Dougherty is also the Homeland Security Advisor to Governor Jay Inslee a member of the governor's executive cabinet and the senior state official in charge of emergency management. He will retire on June 29, 2024 after a military career that spans 44 years. General Dougherty was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Army in June of 1980. He served for nine years in the regular army before transferring to the Washington National Guard. As an army helicopter pilot, General Dougherty has over 1,300 hours flying Blackhawk, Kiowa, Cobra, and Huey helicopters. He has commanded Army and Army National Guard units at all levels of command up to the two-star level. General Dougherty holds a Master of Strategic Studies degree from the U.S. Army War College, a Master of Public Administration from Seattle University, a Master of Science degree in Psychology from the University of Central Texas, a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology from Seattle University, and a teaching certificate from the University of Washington. Prior to being called back to active duty with the National Guard, he was a social studies teacher, football coach, and track coach at Meridian Junior High. So I'm very honored <laughs> to have him here. Um, and congratulations on your impending retirement. You. And please, <laughs> Thanks. Really an honor to be here with you today. Uh, I'm just so impressed by your volunteerism and your public spirit. And it's just really great to be here. Um, so you heard my name is Brad Dougherty. And uh, the thing I'm most proud of uh, out of all that big long resume, that, that's how you know it's time to, uh, to retire with the bio. And uh, my, mine is definitely too long. But uh, I was most proud of being a teacher. And uh, I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, I'd still be there today if I hadn't been called back to active duty after 9 11 or be So, anyway, books and uh, learning and reading are near and dear to my heart. Uh, but I'm also a, a, a new commissioner on CERB Washington, and that's the uh, state's commission uh, for national and community service. And that's what brings me here today. So, CERB Washington advances uh, national service volunteerism, like you good folks, and civic engagement to improve lives. It expands opportunity to meet local critical needs of the residents of Washington and strengthens community capacity and while creating healthy and resilient communities. So whether it's formal service through an organization or just informally helping a friend or a neighbor in need, volunteerism promotes bonds across various races, cultures, beliefs, backgrounds, and experiences. I'm sure you could all attest to that. Through these awards, we recognize people who address the issues that face their communities while reflecting uh, the great diversity of our state. So there, that's the warm up. Okay, now we're gonna get down to brass tacks. This is really all about Rick. And uh, Rick, I'm gonna ask you just to kind of come up if you don't mind. I'll, I'm gonna just read this script while you're up here. I don't, some people don't like standing up. Something tells me you're okay with it. <laughs> so today I'm here to award Rick Sight the Individual Volunteer Service Award for the Northern Puget Sound region. Rick is receiving this award for his commitment as a volunteer, 
audiobook narrator here at the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library, uh, making books accessible to every county in our state. Rick has recorded 43 books, if the tally I have is right, for over 15 years, narrating with great inflection and meaning for youth and adult audiences in diverse categories. Books set in the Northwest, about uh, those about Jewish experience, uh, the LGBTQIA plus experience, fantasy, paranormal, historical fiction, romance, mysteries, thrillers, Christian fiction, military nonfiction, sports stories, U.S. history nonfiction, biography, and memoir, humor, inspirational works, and even satire. I think that covers about <laughs> Rick's work has a direct impact on patrons who are blind, visually impaired, have a physical disability that prevents them from holding a book or turning pages. They may have a brain injury or a reading disability. The audiobooks he records mean blindness or other physically or neurologic uh, conditions won't get in the way of someone's ability to actually enjoy a good book. I mean, what a gift. This past year, Rick volunteered over 1,000 hours, showing up every week, even through bad weather, to do his volunteer shift. <laughs> kind of like the post office. <laughs> there. Rick has helped the Washington Talking Book and Braille Library become a leader in the national network in providing the first own voices audiobooks through his narration of LGBTQIA plus authored books and those exploring the Jewish experience. Rick is a living example of the old saying that the purpose of life is a life purpose. On behalf of the state of Washington, it is my honor to present this award and thank you for lifting up your community and providing an example of engagement that we all can follow. Congratulations, Rick. Let's give it up. Thank you.
he says very kindly and very gently sometimes is, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> it's not right. You didn't pronounce it correctly. Even if you think you did. Um, I've suffered through that with John for <laughs> 16 years uh, of the do it again -ness that we are sometimes called upon. To me, it's the most important thing that the staff and the rest of us as volunteers always strive to do 100% here. And that it's not accepted to do less. So accept this for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, General Doherty, and congratulations, Rick. Very well deserved, and I'm so glad that we were able to do this today. So our next item on the agenda, I'm very excited about. We have a conversation with the author of My Unforgotten Seattle, Ron Chu, and Wachabo Audio Department Supervisor, John Pai. Ron Chu is principal of Chu Communications, a Seattle-based consulting firm which documents community history and helps museums and emerging nonprofits cope with organizational growth. From 2010 to 2020, he served as executive director of the International Community Health Services Foundation, where he raised funds to build new health clinics in Shoreline and Bellevue, and to support other services serving API immigrants and refugees, as well as other underserved populations. Previously, he served as executive director of the Wing Luke Museum, where he spearheaded a 23 million capital campaign to build the new museum. Chu also worked for over 13 years as editor of the International Examiner, a newspaper in Seattle's Chinatown International District. He currently serves on the board of trustees. Chu is a lifelong Seattle resident. He graduated from Franklin High School and attended the University of Washington, where he majored in journalism. In 2001, Chu was appointed to the National Council on the Humanities by President Bill Clinton. He was a recipient of the Ford Foundation's Leadership for a Changing World Award and was named to the American Alliance of Museums Centennial Honor Roll. Chu served on the Seattle Public Library Foundation Board of Directors during the successful 1998 Libraries for All Capital Campaign, which raised over $80 million to build a new central library and support 27 neighborhood branches. He currently serves on the Board of Trustees as well. In 2020, he published his memoir, My Unforgotten Seattle. The audiobook version is available. We're gonna be talking about it. Um, Ron is currently helping the International Community Health Services on a capital campaign to build an aging in place facility on Beacon Hill. And John Pye, who many of us in the room know and love, was originally a volunteer himself at Watauble. He then started working here as a broadcaster with our Evergreen Radio Reading Service in 2003, where he worked until 2011. And thankfully, John came back as our audio production supervisor in 2013 and has been growing and expanding that program ever since, including taking on the production of the Washington State Voters Pamphlet, Washington Council of the Blind Newsline Newsletter, and the addition of a podcasting program. John also leverages his professional skills in photography, video, and audio to support the library events and program. John is an integral part of the Watabo team, and I'm very excited to invite them both up to have a conversation about the work they've been doing together on Ron's book. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Well, I have to be here. It's not an honor to do both because uh, I feel very blessed to be actually working with volunteer staff here because they are. 
are so incredible and so dedicated. And it doesn't take too much to ask for 100 percent because everybody gives 100 percent. So it's it's pretty uh, pretty life invigorating. So we actually have a very rare opportunity now because it's kind of unusual to have a book that we produce uh, that we actually have the original author be part of the process. And you know, it's kind of a long, uh, kind of a well, we, we can talk about that later about how we were able to do this. But uh, Ron's book is, is, is quite incredible for especially uh, from uh, the Seattle perspective. You know, it's not just a community. Uh, story or memoir. It's, 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 it's kind of cross borders with that. So I kind of wanted to kind of start things off by asking you, uh, why did you write the book? Well, uh, let's see. First of all, it's a little bit uh, humbling to be here in John's workspace uh, among folks who know John well. And, uh, I know John well. Personal level, because that's one of the quite some time since we moved to Seattle. 30 years. Yeah, so we'll <laughs> grow old together. Um, but uh, the book um, came about uh, really because of uh, my interest in uh, preserving community history and then also preserving the experiences of folks. That I grew up with, um, and the elders in the community that I knew who were passing away. Um, back in 2015, I think was when Donnie Chin passed away. I don't know if any of you recall the stories. He's a bank in Chinatown in the National District area who was gunned down, driven in crossfire between two rival gangs. To this date, uh, Perpetrators have been brought to justice. The tragedy on that one. But um, anyway, I was going on morning run and it was, uh, I've been some time since Johnny had passed away and I started thinking about the past and the present and uh, was really thinking about Johnny's death and then the passage of many folks in the community that I knew who were the elders that uh, said, well, I should do a book, you know. So anyway, I wrote the book over the period of uh, a few years. Um, after it was completed, uh, there was a young person that John and I both know who uh, mentioned, you know, uh, he thought of an audio book. Why? Why? Well, because a lot of us, uh, we learn through different means. Some of us don't read well. Some of us don't read, uh, so let's listen. Um, that got me thinking a little bit. Um, I myself uh, have vision issues. I have myopic macular degeneration, one eye, so I really can't see out of one eye. The other eye is not so good, so you know, I, I appreciate large print books and accessible you know, well, access and the option for others to hear the stories that are about. And at that juncture, I turned to John. John, of course, being the steady, uh, calming influence. I said, this could be done. You know, I'm thinking there'll be a volunteer or somebody from the library that made this. No, you're going to be there. I can't do this. I have no idea what, no idea what I've been doing. Anyway, uh, listening with great interest to what Rick was saying about John's way of his, um, his, his, um, Hoaxing, calm way of making you do stuff you wouldn't do otherwise. <laughs> and it's perfectionism to make it better, not settle for simply good enough. And so, in the course of uh, two and a half, every weekend, Sundays with John, uh, we take the chapter and uh, I began to appreciate, you know, the work that many of you do. Uh, it's hard work, I'll tell you. After you know, a few minutes, sometimes you just don't have it. You just kind of got to plow through it. So that's what this book came about. Marina, uh, Ben 
sense and actually she cannot read standard print and she actually at the time did not know that she was qualified for services here so we actually were able to sign her up for services here uh, even though you know eventually she moved to new york but she's back now um, but then you know seeing that you had written that book i had always wanted to see about getting you in here to try to fill that book um, but luckily you know it was kind of an interesting process because uh, you wanted to share this book uh, with everyone. So it was kind of a, uh, because when we record books here, basically they're primarily for our patrons. And so they are protected under the uh, People Rights uh, Act to be able to be available to all of our patrons free of charge and everything else, and we can record these, but the general public cannot access these books. And uh, Ron was very interested in trying to maintain the ability to share the book with the general public to anyone. So we kind of went to the route of recording separately and then Ron donating the audio file later to the library. So we have actually now in two forms, we have Book available on Ron's website uh, as a download, and you can listen to it through YouTube. And you know, you can just click on it, it's in five sections because it's a long book 22 hours. So, and YouTube had a maximum amount of about five hours moments, so we flipped it into four five sections. And then we also have it uploaded and completed in the uh, uh, National Library Services collection, so we have it available in two, two areas. That's just uh, again that whole issue of access, uh, making stories available to folks who wouldn't have brought that. That's a great joy in that. I throughout the book as a you know very uh, niche audience, hyper local um, production. You know, we didn't receive any proceeds from it because it was you know. I had been cautioned by the Richmond Club and do these things. So it's a very local publication. I'm making my own music. So it was um, it was sponsored by the International Examiner uh, newspaper as the publisher. So all the proceeds went to the International Examiner to support their work. And then the University of Washington Press uh, helped market and distribute it. But, I was amazed uh, at, at the great interest in it. It was 2,500 copy run. It's sold out now. Uh, we're looking at getting it out to paperback form as well. We have press that should be printed and around the work. Uh, but uh, again, I was surprised you know, at the interest in local stories. Story. That's the thing that my eyes were open to. Uh, you know, because I didn't know John, I didn't actually know what John did. You know, I didn't realize it was folks like Rick, you know, the folk authors. Um, and, uh, you know, and then the further value of recording local authors in their own voices um, with some of the language that. Uh, pronunciation of Chinese words, so forth, you know, is made much easier if the author can actually say it themselves. Um, I should mention after I, as I started recording the book, it got easier as I got to be 10 years of back from 12, uh, still hard, but I got more comfortable with it. But I remember listening to uh, Michelle Obama audiobook. Uh, at that point, my ears are so tuned to, I, you know, at first I realized that she's not reading the whole thing continuously and boom, it's all out there. She's rereading sections and so forth. So I started being able to figure out, oh, God, she's really, this is a bad day for her. <laughs> you know, it's just like, there isn't anything there, it's no pop. And other times it's just, she's really interested. So, again, I, I can imagine again just meeting Rick here. Like there's probably some days where you just kind of turn it up and other days. So, you know, I'm impressed.
impressed with the work that's happening here. Um, and then just that, you know, what it takes to do this. I don't know if I do another audio, but <laughs> by reading it, there's maybe a section that you could uh, read from the book. There are millions. But <laughs> 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 um, then John might sit here and start, you know, fiddling with no, is that right, Ron? You better read that. <laughs> so, uh, I was thinking, um, little section about how I got into reading uh, in my Beacon Hill, the old Beacon Hill Library. Uh, Beacon Junction. Uh, many of you used to dabble. I can remember grocery stores converted into a library. Thought maybe I'd read a few pages from that. As I was sitting back there, I was thinking, you know, I could read a section about John, me being the ordained or or minister to marry him, then that might embarrass me. <laughs> Definitely because of my myopic macular degeneration. So bear with me. <clears throat> Chapter 14. And this is eerie because of John kept doing during all these uh, <laughs> teachings, like fiddling with this and that. And that, and that, and that, and that. Uh, Chapter 14. A door opened into a world of books. Even before I could read, I loved to open children's books and pour over the illustrations. <clears throat> I marveled at the well scrubbed, ruby faced people in the Dick and Jane Reader. Saw Christine Holmes, white picket fences, four screen lawns, and litter free streets. This jeweled world seemed so much more desirable than my own. I wanted to shrink myself and jump in. I dreamed up stories to match the pictures and the mysterious, rigid words I could barely cite. And I should mention by way of background that <clears throat> I grew up in a Chinese speaking hall. So, uh, you know, this is a foggy period between my growing up years where I did only speak English. So it wasn't spoken in the hall. But transition to school was very difficult. I imagined riding through Chinatown on the back of the friendly dinosaur in Danny and the Dinosaurs, or flying on Elmer elevators, baby dragon to a hidden jungle filled with ripe persimmons. I discovered the Beacon Hill Library on a third grade class field trip. It was located in a nondescript storefront at the junction of Beacon Avenue South and 15th Avenue South. The space used to be a grocery store, but it was converted into a 3,300 square foot library in 1961. The librarian, Mrs. Norma O'Brien, told us all to sit down on the worn tile floor and be still. The black pot belly stove with a tall stove pipe hung in the background. She read two simple picture books, pausing to display the bright, colorful illustrations. She showed us a wooden cabinet called the card catalog, <laughs> explaining that everything was organized according to the Dewey Decimal System. She then told us how we could borrow books to read. We had to return them before the staff and expiration dates decided to cover them. With the end of school around the corner, she encouraged us to join the library and summer reading club, where each book you read you earned one star. If you got at least 10 stars, your name appeared on a special list posted on the front window. I wanted to see my name on the window. I wanted to see how many stars I could get. But I knew it would be tough. I could 
could barely read. I checked out the easiest picture book I could find. I stuttered and faked my way through sessions with Ms. O'Brien to claim credit for my books. I was relieved that she didn't ask many questions. She mostly smiled and nodded. My first year at the Reading Club was 1962. I was in the fourth grade. I was in the fourth grade. I received a certificate adorned with the Century 21 Exposition logo and an image of the space meter. In 1963, the reading club theme was Sail Around Seattle. I had never been on a boat. My certificate came with an official Seattle Public Library gold seal. Proud. My parents were pleased that I was at the library. They trusted it was safe. They were thrilled that I could borrow a lot of books for free. My mother called it the library when she tried to pronounce the word. In Chinese, she called it musiguan. It was ironic that I loved holding books in my hand. I was nearly illiterate. For years, my mind swirled in a dense fog as I transitioned. To an English speaking school outside my Chinese speaking home. Teachers shunted me off to the poorest reading groups. There, I simply kept quiet and tried not to make any trouble. That didn't deter me from staring at pictures and daydreaming. I persisted. My vocabulary increased as they coupled images with words. My mother's gift for storytelling and my parents' love of learning pushed. As I entered junior high and high school, peer pressure drew my vulnerable male friends in fights, gangs, and drugs. A few tried to drag me in. I resisted. The library gave me a place to hide. The smell of aging books on wooden shelves wrapped me in the kindness and faith of grace. I pulled out the same well thumbed books from familiar publishers and buried myself in the tales of. Paul Bunyan and his new ox lady, and all the heroic journey of Johnny Appleby. I, I applauded the cleverness of the five Chinese brothers when I, I poured over Lois Lansing's illustrations. My favorite book was Gertrude Chandler Warner's The Boxcar Children. Linda, his title sister, told me about it. I checked it out and read dozen times. I love the story of the four orphan children who made a home in an abandoned boxcar. It was Henry, the older brother, Jesse, the older sister who cooked and looked after the others, Violet, the sensitive younger sister, and Benny, a cute seven-year-old who found a craft, craft pink cup in the dump. In the end, kind-hearted grandfather rescued them all. The book was filled with, with memorable black and white silhouetted illustrations. I connected the story to my own life. At times it seemed as if my parents didn't exist because they were always working. Henry was my brother Tom. Jesse was Linda. And Benny was Harvey. I never had a chance to meet or know my grandparents. The thought that a grandfather might miraculously show up one day, plucking us out of poverty, was a delightful fantasy. I'm going to stop there and go on. It gives you a, a flavor of uh, you know, how books really transform my life.
about rediscovering my own history because it had not been told in history books. Um, I'm going to talk about much of uh, media activism in the 1960s and 70s, of which I was part of, that helped transform the neighborhood and revitalize curating structures, uh, providing social services for community elders and immigrant families. You know, the neighborhood's gone through many, many changes. Um, the book ends, actually. I finished the book um, literally right before the pandemic. Uh, being a journalist, I realized, well, it's going to be kind of weird. I ship it off the printers, it comes back, there's nothing on the pandemic. So I stopped the presses, took a, a week and created a final chapter on the pandemic and the impact that was going on. It's been screwed up the pagination, had the index, so forth, but then it kind of made it a little more current. So it kind of ended there. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a journey. And it's available for where actually all volunteers can hear it the audio book um, at, at your website. Yeah. And I should mention, I did bring two copies of the book. It is out of print. And any of you who, who really, really want a copy, I'm happy to do a signed copy of the book. Any questions? mention also that that experience made me realize that the spoken word is different from the printed word. And you know, there are many times where I wished I had written it differently so that it could also be listened to and not simply looked at with the eyes. I'm sure you guys all know it's like a little different thing. Some things it's hard to read that work okay for the eye. They don't work for the ears. Um, as I read the book, uh, I, I was reliving a lot of things. And that was hard at times. I'm sure John, you may have some thoughts out there about the sections which um, made things come alive for you in a way that was really profound. But uh, yeah, there's something about reading a book. That uh, makes you relive an experience at a deeper level and makes you think about other things that perhaps um, I shouldn't, I should have written about. But open many doors. Um, funny thing, I, right now, I don't know, are any of you Stephen King fans? Okay, <laughs> So, uh, I've sort of been, but not so much. You know, I, I like his book on memoir writing. That got me more re interested in reading. So I checked out a, uh, a book he wrote titled It. <laughs> it is a big book. It's a thousand one hundred page I don't know why. Anyway, uh, so I'm reading it. It's not so good, actually. Uh, and part of it's would be good. Hell of a thing to read it. You know, I'm sure it's been read or whatever, but it's just it's not so good to sit in the ear. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. Hi. Sorry, sorry. I understand that you're a runner. Are you still running on a regular basis? I'm a runner. I'm the crazy guy every morning who goes out and does 10 to 13 miles at a time. 
so uh, yeah, don't ask me about the job. You're a regular walker, right? You're your blog and thing. So, uh, but you know, the funny thing is, I actually do it for the health of you know, you get 70 and you go on and on, you suffer for the body. But for healthy, it's also so I can listen to my audio books and podcasts. <laughs> you know, so if the podcast is going for an hour and a half, I got to run for an hour and a half. That's <laughs> how it is. Tell us more about the fundraising that you're doing for the Senior Center on Vegan Health. Yeah, so uh, as was mentioned in the brief bio, I work uh, as Director of International Community Health Services uh, for uh, years. Uh, I retired, I'm sort of not really retired. They're all good campaigns. But one campaign that's uh, being directed by International Community Health Services developing a senior care facility up on Beacon Hill. And probably if you go by there, there's a, where Pat Med is, there's construction going on. There's a workforce housing, senior housing, and a uh, PACE program, Program of All Inclusive Care for the Elderly. Um, provides a series of medical and social services, wraparound services for frail nursing home seniors who um, want to stay in their home um, but then have supports that enable them to remain independent. So raising money for a 25,000 square foot facility will be the first Asian Pacific American uh, Asian place project in the country right here on Beacon Hill. So we're about halfway done fundraising and uh, yeah that's uh, one project that we continue to fund. Yeah. yeah so in your book you talk about the most important things in the international district says be the legal efforts to go on. What about today? What are the things that you want us to be most aware of? Part of the challenge for the community has always been getting adequate resources to enable, uh, you know, the repair, remodel of uh, aging structures that are not structurally sound. Uh, getting resources to support small community businesses. Uh, you know, in the post, or I'm sorry, during the pandemic. The neighbor was hugely impacted. Um, you know, there was a lot of anti-Asian violence even here in Seattle uh, because a lot of the frail seniors became very vulnerable to attacks. Uh, I mean, South being liars, I thought that the big deal. People thought we were responsible for the pandemic. You know, Kung flu, all that sort of stuff. I'm shocked that the of Seattle like, I think it's happening. Um, so the community is trying to revitalize itself in that period, and it's been really hard. Um, you know, I'm mindful also of the fragility of certain sections of the International District. So the um, little Saigon area is deeply affected by a lot of the transit population over near Twelfth and Jackson. Um, it's pretty awful. The homelessness crisis is really on our doorstep. Um, so those are some of the challenges. On a hopeful note, and John and I are actually later on going to go and uh, photograph. Um, there are some anchor businesses that will still continue post-pandemic. Thai Tongue Restaurant. And if you go there, support Thai Town. Across the street, on the other side, Cow Cow Barbecue Restaurant. Um, Cow Cow, uh, I'm writing up a story for the International Family, recently sold to uh, 
guy who chopped the barbecue meat in the front. He's 81 years old. Uh, so his family's taking over this business. It's going to continue. Um, so uh, we're going to go down there and shoot some photographs of the owner of Tai Tan, which is a restaurant in Brown since 1935, and this 81 year old owner, his son, who's going to manage it. Uh, to, to show the durability of the neighborhood, the continuity, because ultimately, you know, the work we do and that you do is about um, connecting what once was, what is and will be. That's, um, I think, the space we all operate in. Uh, they're doing fine. Uh, it's now in the generation that passed on from Tomio Marcucci, who was the CEO for many years, um, to now his daughter Denise, who's running the business. But uh, you know, there's Tomio uh, close to 90, lurking around the background. That's right, one of the kids trying to run the business for Tomio. But Tomio's a, he's actually working on his own memoir. I've been helping him a little bit with that. Um, and hopefully, we've got to document his story so he can pass it and enjoy it. I actually have a question for John. Um, John, I mean, you oversee so many audiobooks that are produced. What was this experience like for you, sort of working one on one with an author, like just someone that, someone that you know well? Um, yeah, I'd just like to hear more about that experience. Well, initially, I thought that I would be able to, because I, I modeled the uh, recording of the book that we were going to do with Ron in the way that we have the remote recording system here at the, at the library. So I said, hey, Ron, I'm going to give you this uh, uh, digital recorder. Here's a microphone and a mic uh, amplifier. Go ahead and, you know, when you have time, maybe you can do this maybe a couple times a week to record yourself. Well, so basically, uh, and I thought Ron would be able to be able to do this. He told me to do it, and I did <laughs> <laughs> And so then he said, no, I can't really do it. So basically, I just feel like I had to uh, come in here and kind of, uh, not, not necessarily babysit, but it was actually a great experience for me. <laughs> uh, you know, we, I don't get that sure chance to sit here and volunteer to cure them, because then, you also can actually, uh, you know, at the moment, you know, make changes, or you realize that you missed a sentence or something as you're as you're going along. So the actual uh, ultimate review process then is a little bit uh, less arduous of like maybe missing whole sections. And in fact, uh, one of our volunteers we we able to uh, actually steal her services for us. So Judy Ogliori actually. Listen to the 24 plus hours of the original file of the book and just to uh, kind of find the stuff that we did still miss. Well, and then I, I've got a credit to Judy. I mean, it's just, you know, the precision, the detail, just catching all the stuff. Just... Yeah. 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 But it was also something very interesting that Judy remarked that. The book to her was kind of her remembrance of yeah, like her story. Yeah, I so, loved it. There were so many parts that you mentioned that were all part of my life. My, my dad was a teacher and a counselor at Target. And, um, Frank Cantwell and Frank Fiddler were all part of our lives. So, and Sun King Restaurant, that's where I went when I went to the University of Washington. Wow. All those things just are sort of, it was a delight to me. That's the thing, maybe as I mentioned, the surprising success of the book to me, again, we're not talking about New York Times, but I'm just talking about within the niche audience. I've been speaking to so many, you know, I've been at the Verizon now, I've been seeing your care facilities, because um, uh, the book resonated for them because they recognize people and places, their experience. 
You know, they didn't necessarily have to be Chinese American. You know, there was because a lot of it is not Chinese American; it's just Seattle. Um, but uh, I think the joy that a lot of them got out of seeing some of their experience uh, captured really made it all worthwhile to me. Uh, when I first proposed the book, uh, I talked to the University of Washington. They actually wanted to get, make it much shorter. They said it's, it's way too long. It's got to, you know, some copies. It's like it's, it's got to be about a third of the length. And they have a formula, and it probably works most of the time. But it, I wasn't interested in uh, broadening the audience. I was interested more deeply in the audience, making it that would be worthwhile to them. Um, and funny thing, you know, because they could distribute the book as we need more books, but there's no more, you know, and so they suggested a paperback version and a reprint, or just, just get some more copies out. We'll have more. And, uh, um, fortunately, a donor actually couple weeks ago, we've got both of our paid the whole thing, you know, because they just gave two years plus for the book. And so, um, but, but again, there's a value in not necessarily looking at being a bestseller, if that makes sense, but having something that's worthwhile for people uh, on a local level who just are, are interested in not so much in popular title, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it, it's been a great journey. It's been wonderful, the letters I've gotten. I had reunited with my own um, high school creative writing teacher who was a little YouTube video on this Alice Allen, my creative writing teacher at Franklin High School. I haven't seen her in a few years since high school, 40 plus years. She was just living on the other side of Beacon Hill. I didn't realize she was there. And so uh, she had found out about the book from another teacher who had read the book, and her student's book. And then she emailed me and copied for her. And then we did a little taping session. Uh, Seattle Channel. Seattle Channel. Yeah. But just a wonderful connection they have. Well, then that book itself, too, I mean, memoir is kind of a, a misnomer. Most memoirs are very, I would say, very kind of self centered type stuff. But it, it, you know, your book is almost, it's, a, it's these vignettes, it's these moments in a community's life and then with the people that you experience that, uh, you know, every week, you know, it was 72 plus weeks that we got together to record this because we did a chapter. Uh, but it was, I look forward to it. Because it was, I mean, I did read the book, but it, again, hearing the book through Ron's voice. And that's why I was so adamant about having him read it, because he has a vernacular and has a uh, oral style that is very specific. And you cannot just have anybody just read the book and have it come alive. And, and to me, every week I would be able to have a specific chapter come alive. And it wasn't just, you know, it is, and it's all split up to where you could just listen to one or two chapters and come back to it. It kind of reads very nicely that way. It's kind of a, kind of a great kind of compilation. It's almost like it's almost like a serial. It could have been like, a, okay, a chapter uh, a week in the newspaper. Yeah, or a podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we actually did start talking about these podcasts that were what the. So does the Seattle Public Library have quite a few copies? Uh, I, I know they have copies at the library, yes. Uh, I don't know. Did you do an author of it to publish? Uh, I'm sure I did. I, I'm actually going to be out in Woodenville doing some author things at uh, the Woodenville Public Library. But yeah, it's uh, I've been making the rounds, doing a lot of Surprise, there are so many book clubs. That, that's another thing I discovered. That there's book clubs everywhere. It's not just book clubs. But I would love to get out.
have the you have connections to any of the other uh, libraries around the area. For me, it's no struggle because I make it these personal connections. People, you know, uh, many many grew up in Seattle. They moved away, right? And so there's a, a little connection to home for them. This audio file is maybe something that the Seattle Public Library could offer in their audiobook downloads. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, it's, it's, it's available at his website. Right. You just go and you can listen to it right there. So you have uh, to without, without a player, without a specific kind of book, you don't have to download to be part of you know, the system. Because that was the biggest the other learning thing for me. Uh, with doing or producing an audio book outside the confines of the library because we have a very structured, you know, we have, you know, we have proprietary players, we have all the other layers of, you know, of, you know kind of material that we were able to, to, to bank on. When we were producing this, we even had a problem with the website. Uh, we saying, well, you have the right to do this, but we can't have, uh, you know, Lengths longer than 15 minutes and everything else. So, you know, it was a very le big learning process for us to kind of like, oh, how do we get this book? We just want to have people listen to it. We don't want anything from it. And, and that was like a, a challenge because we were actually had a uh, an event for AARP that we were trying to, you know, they put talk to Ron about the production of the book and everything else. And we were hoping to get the audio book live at that point. This was about a couple of months ago. And then it was like, Oh, God, there's all these other barriers to be able to just even share it freely. But at Ron's website, which is what's your website? Oh, uh, communication. So C H E W communications with the S dot com. com. Yeah. Uh, you can go to that site. Uh, there'll be books that Ron has written. He's, he's also written other titles as well uh, that are uh, some of that we need to read in the future. Uh, we'll talk about that. But, but to your point about, I mean, it'd be nice if Seattle Public Library maybe promotes it somehow, says here's where to get it, or some way for folks who are Seattle Public Library patrons to, you know, but I, I don't want to feel like I'm the one doing it because I'm not a board of trustees. I don't want to feel like I'm promoting, even though I'm not making money from it. So others won't suggest that. Okay, well, we get to the point. Oh, there's one more question. I, I just wanted to, I don't have a question, but I looked up and the Seattle Public Library has 21 copies, 16 currently available. Awesome. Print is books, not audio. It is, yes, it's print, 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 print books. But I don't think this is that hard. I was looking myself. We also um, have multiple, we have several copies of the State Library. I think you just have to put that URL in the record. I don't really need that much. Well, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you again, Ron and John. Congratulations, Rick. Well deserved. Thank you all of you volunteers, again, for the work you do. Don't forget to take your fun Watauble socks to make your feet happy. And there's plenty of food over here. And you don't have to go anywhere. You're always welcome here. So thank you.